I apologize if I get a little emotional during this homily, but just uh, a notice. You know, this gospel passage is very uh, dear to me because especially after my ordination, the first Kurbanah that I celebrated at St. Joseph in Tampa was this, it was this gospel passage that I was supposed to read. And I was so nervous that first day, especially celebrating Holy Kurbanah, that even though I had prepared a homily on the Good Samaritan, I was, I went to read the gospel, I read the wrong gospel. And I read it and I knew I was reading the wrong gospel. And then after I finished reading the gospel, I began the homily and I said, I'm sorry, I read the wrong gospel passage. But I want you to put the story of the Good Samaritan in your mind. And I went on. So I began my ministry as a priest preaching with saying, I'm sorry. And today, again, I like that sentiment of being able to say, I'm sorry. Because for us to be able to understand how to be like the Good Samaritan, we need to realize that we have been wrong at times, and we need to be able to say sorry. So let's go deeper into this gospel passage today. At the very beginning, we hear our Lord having a conversation with his disciples in private. Maybe they're talking kind of in a low voice. But the Lord is essentially saying that many desire to see and many desire to hear. But the reality is that they won't be able to. So this is the beginning of this gospel passage. And as we continue, now the conversation is public. So it was private And we are now hearing the public part. The public part begins where a scholar of the law asks the question, how am I to attain eternal life, essentially? The scholar of the law knows the answer. And we're all scholars in a certain sense because we know exactly what he's going to give as a response when Jesus turns the question back to him. We know it that we are to love with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. We are to love God in this way, with all our strength. And the last part is a little difficult, but still we know it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so the scholar of the law is able to articulate the great commandment. And the Lord says, good, correct. Now go do it. The scholar knows. He has it all in his head of what needs to be done. But yet, he has to ask one more question, which is regarding the last part. But who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And that's an important question for us to ask The scholar asks it, and it's a good one. And it's to that question that we get this beautiful story of the good Samaritan. Because the Lord is changing the way, particularly in how we look at our neighbor. Especially at that time, one would understand your neighbor as a person who comes essentially from your community, or maybe also someone who has settled in the same land, but essentially your neighbor is one who you are comfortable with, who you identify with in a certain way. But the Lord is challenging that notion with this particular story of the Good Samaritan, saying that's not it. That's not just what a neighbor is. Your neighbor is not only that, but anyone who needs help. Anyone who's living and breathing is our neighbor. And so what was difficult then is difficult now. Because has our definition of neighbor changed much? 
I look at myself and I realize that maybe not so much because at times I'm more willing to want to love those who I feel comfortable with, those who speak the same language, a lot of times those who have the same skin color as I have. But the Lord is challenging us to go beyond in loving what is simply comfortable for us, but every single person. And so in the wake of all that has been happening in our country, we've watched the death of George Floyd. We've been hearing again about other incidences, especially of racist acts towards black men and women, Eric Gardner, Breonna Taylor, the list goes on and on. And essentially the overall overlying story is that people have died because of racism, because of their skin color. And if that's the case, then we should see that in our society, we haven't moved past the definition of what neighbor was then. Because if neighbor is loving everyone, then we have work to do because our society does not see it to be the case. But then I try to console myself and say, well, I love all people. I grew up here in America. Skin color is not a matter to me. I have no problems. I'm a priest. Of course I love all people. But no. No, 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 dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm an absolute hypocrite. Because the reality is that subconsciously in my mind, there are certain racist attitudes that, that exist in my upbringing. Very subconsciously, the skin color does matter. The skin color has been a part, if you're too dark, then maybe there's something wrong. And so in certain ways, subconsciously, I know that I've grown up with certain racist attitudes. And so I need to challenge myself in being able to see my neighbor as everyone. And I think all of us too. Because if what is happening in society is a product of a general thing, then we have to look at ourselves individually and ask ourselves, is there anything in us where we prevent ourselves from loving the other person. The United States Bishops' Conference a few years ago wrote a document about racism. And one of the beautiful quotes from this document says that every racist act, every negative comment, every joke, every disparaging comment, every look in a reaction to skin color that is negative, every discrimination by place and origin is a failure to acknowledge the other person as created in the image of God. So we might not be doing big acts of racism, but the smallest things, the smallest words contribute to what we see in our society today. This is the great sin of racism that exists within our own communities and with our own homes. We have to do something. But it goes back especially to first knowing that we are to love the Lord with all our hearts and all our minds and all our strength and all our soul. I remember a few years ago when I was hearing Bishop Thomas Darrell speaking about the Eucharist. And he was sharing an experience where he was a priest working in an Italian parish. And he was excited because he got a call to go bring communion to the sick. But the secretary decided to go ahead and take the sacred host from the tabernacle and have it ready for him. And this happens in Italy. But unfortunately, Bishop Thomas discovered that the Eucharist kept in the pricks the golden little container, was on the secretary's desk, along with the secretary's mascara and lipstick and all other things. There our Lord was kept. 
along with all these things, pens, papers. And Bishop Thomas said, I'll I'll go and get it. And she said, no, no, no. Jesus is already here in the midst of all that. And I remember hearing that story and thinking to myself, what a disgrace. How sad is that to put our Lord in such a place? We give reverence, we give honor and respect to our Lord. But in the same way, if we feel anything, any sense of disgust, thinking about our Lord being in such a place, we should also feel that when an innocent person is violated of their human dignity because of race. We should feel that because each person that we encounter, whether we acknowledge it or not, is the body of Christ. There's an African-American priest by the name of Father Josh who says maybe for us to get over racism, we need to look at the other person and say, George is the body of Christ. Whoever it is, put that name and say, that is the body of Christ. And if we can begin to do that, then we can slowly overcome the hatred, the animosity that might exist subconsciously or actually in a very direct way in our lives. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if we want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, we need to treat others with mercy. If we walk past those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are our neighbors and don't do anything, fail to love them, that we are no different from the priest and the Levite in the gospel passage today. Let us have the strength to be able to respond to this invitation to be the Good Samaritan. All of us are called to this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.